Hello again, MMA True Believers. I am Jason Burgos for SureDog.com, and I am joined by an athlete who has waited a long time to make his return to the octagon. After 25 months away from the sport, recovering from a major back injury, and that man is the one they call the Cuban Missile Crisis, a.k.a. Julian Marquez. Mr. Crisis, sir, thanks for the time today to talk the long road back to this moment. Man, thank you for having me. It has been a journey, <laughs> to say the least, but I am happy. I am here, and we're ready yeah, to I have rock. A, a ton of questions for you, so I'll jump right into it. I interviewed Charles Rosa a few months back, and we talked about like the neck injury that he had that like put him on, on the shelf for a long time, had a long road back, and the doubts about his career at the time. You had just a serious injury with the major back muscle tear, and I read your interview with MMA Junkie where you explained like the severity of it and that the injury was like pretty rare. Like so, first explain to folks watching this that may not have read that article or saw that interview how serious the injury was, and also that story of how your doctor in Chicago had never seen a latissimus, latissimus dorsi Lit tear. Latissimus dorsi tendon. So my latissimus dorsi tendon snapped completely off. And I severed mm. it completely off in the fight. And that was a fight against Alessio Di Chirico, mm -hmm. um, July 6, 2018. In the first round, I actually have photos of my arm being like punching, being thrown, mm. landing, and there's a hole right mm. where the attendant connects wow. and how severe it is. The doctor Verma over there in Chicago does a lot of these surgeries a year and they do it on MLB pitchers. Now when this Latimus Dorsey tendon usually tears whenever a pitcher throws a fastball and overextends their arm further than the muscle allows or the mm. tendon allows. And it just, it pulls it just a little bit mm. to where whenever I went into surgery, it wasn't even connected. My, wow. my arm was not connected to the back. My pulling muscle, my pushing muscle, which it's crazy. I have these photos of when I throw the punch, you can see it ripped. You can see the redness high on the lat mm -hmm. where you could see it curled up. And then on top of it, you can see how the mind and the body work together in the middle of a um, fight where I clinch up with him and I couldn't pull with my right arm. So my left arm reached around, grabbed my right arm at the wrist, and it held. And you see me <laughs> pulling like wow. that. And there was multiple, multiple spots in that fight where it was like that. So when I went there, um, we had surgery, and uh, the surgery was a success. They mounted it back in my arm. The problem with that is that the surgery, you need to had six weeks of being immobile because they made, mm. you need to uh, attach this. He's never seen it severe. Normally, you're moving it in a couple weeks. It's the same thing as if, a, if you have a pec tear mm. or any you know muscular in the front or the side um, or even a labrum. You're moving it within two weeks of surgery. You're trying to get the blood flow. You couldn't risk that because the anchors would have ripped out. Wow. But that caused more problems. Mm -hmm. And then we had multiple surgeries to try to clean up stuff, try to fix it. Because, you know, I turned into Wolverine. I healed way faster than it needed to be. I locked my shoulder up. wasn't allowed to do what it needed to do. And there's points in time where the doctor literally looked at me and said, I don't know what we can do anymore. I don't <laughs> wow. know what's going on. So it was just like, hey, but we kept going, we kept doing it. And now we're here today and we're like, again, we're just a little bit away from August 29th where I'm about to do what I do best and become the greatest in the <laughs> octagon and the most entertaining. Now, going back to like that, that me talking to Charles Rose and stuff like that, he told me he had serious like nerves going into his return. And in camp, he chose to, like, to pretty much tread lightly because he just wanted to stay healthy and just make it to the fight. How has your process in training been? And, and, and at what point did you finally regain trust in your body, regain trust in muscle? Or you really won't have like a thousand percent trust until you go through the fight experience? I signed up for this. I know who I am. I know where I want to be. I know the risk. I, I understand what happened. So when I went back to training, I went back. When they cleared me and said I can go back, I went back. There's no limitations. There's no stopping me. There's nothing. I, I've been waiting for this moment, and I sat there and dreaded it for many times. I wouldn't say dreaded. I missed it. I was mm. eager. I was hungry. I wanted it. I kept trying to, to do stuff, and my doctor told me to stop. My PT told me to stop. The people told me to relax. So when it came down to it to come to training and do what I need to do, 
nothing has held me back. It's better than ever. I'm back to the old me, but more improved on mental, more improved on technical, and more improved on just all around being an MMA fighter for this camp. What was like the prognosis from doctors on this? Like, is it a type of thing where once something like that, such a major, such a rare injury happens, like the body isn't quite the same ever again, and there's always a chance it could happen again. You're always just trying to strengthen everything around it to avoid that. Or like once you've been repaired, once you recover, a second tear would be just as rare as the first one. Yeah, it's uh, it, it was one of those things that I don't know what they said. I, I don't really care. My PT talked to him multiple pts by the way i didn't just have one i had multiple pts they talk if it happens again then it happens again mm. there's nothing that i can do to prevent it i'm not going to worry about it True. i'm going out there i don't care what happens to me in this game i don't want it to happen but i can't worry about running the risk of going there you know it, it, if it happens it happens if it doesn't happen good um but we're we have everything back to where it needs to be i got full range in the arm i got full strength in the arm it's it's going faster than ever. It feels brand new, and my body's recovered in the past two years. So, like I said, when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, I don't really worry about the doctor because the doctor's always going to give you the the safest route to where, hey, you know, you don't want to do this, or hey, you shouldn't do that. But so far, it's been great. And if it happens again, I signed up for the risk, and I know what's going on. To return from this injury, this sort of injury, I would imagine it has to be one of the hardest things you've had to do in your life. Maybe maybe very well the hardest. Do you feel you entered this fight on some level, maybe even more mentally strong than you were before? Like, if this injury and 25 months away couldn't break me, your opponent can't do anything in that cage that's going to be able to break you. This isn't the toughest thing I've ever been through in my life. This okay. is just an injury. This is just... This is part of the game. This is part of life. You know, you go through uphills and go through downhills. It, it doesn't change who I am. It's not going to change my mentality. And the thing is, is that the difference between me and everybody else is I got to sit there and watch everybody shine while I sat there and called their fights. And I sat there and put bets on their fights. And I sat there and did all the stuff with the UFC, Twitch, and hyped these people up. Now they get to sit back and watch the greatness happen. They get to sit back and watch the Julian Marquez you know, the brawl, the fight, <laughs> the grappling, you get to watch the show, you know, and that's what I bring every time. And that's what the best part about it. Everybody misses it. Everybody misses me, you know, and that's the best part is that now you have me and it's going to be a problem for a lot of people. <laughs> You were only uh, three fights into a contender series contract, which, like, a tough deal is not for big money. And then you are forced into this long layoff like we talked about. What has this period been like financially to not be able to make money off of what you do so very well? If if this injury, you know, never happens, and ha happens you probably make it to your, your second UFC contract and on a raise by now. What have you been doing to, like, to pay the bills, pay your time in the gym also, which isn't cheap either? Well, this is the thing is that I'm just more than just a fighter. Now, most people out there are sitting there banking on being a fighter. They're sitting mm. out banking on being, you know, that person that is going to UFC is going to change their stuff. That contract's going to change it. It's 10 and 10 plus you're paying out percentage in taxes. Yeah. You know, you're, you ain't making no money. Yeah. The thing is, the difference between me and 90 percent of the roster um, is that I invested my money. I bought things when I got mm. my bonus, when I got my money and when I got paid, I used it to invest in property. I used it to invest in um, different things that were going to come back to me, just like the Raiders uh, stadium. I bought into the Raiders stadium. I had seats. I have a bunch of stuff there wow. that had it been this year, it would have been a very, very great profit for me. Um, just alone on one seat alone, I was making, I would have made two grand wow. per seat. That was just on one game wow. on one seat. Yeah. And I have seven. So, this is the thing is that fighting is great, but I have a lot of other things on the outside that kept me going and kept me there. So I wasn't worried about money. I wasn't worried about if I was going to return or not. Eventually, it's going to come back. Eventually, it was here. And look, we're here now. We're still good financially. And I'm fighting. 
And you, you know, you're talking about you, talking about you watching these other people and stuff like that in this time away. Would you say, like, like, are there specific things? Did you have enough time away, especially once the pandemic hit, schedules got adjusted, and fights weren't being made? Did you able? Were you able to get even more time to just completely evolve yourself, reinvent yourself? Like, does the version of Julia Marquez that enters the cage next week, would he beat the guy from 25 months? ago ass because you just are you evolved on a physical technical and even mental level entering this time absolutely with the two years off i you know i learned my who what where's and why's how to cross t's and how to dot i's i'm here <laughs> i learned i evolved and i've gotten better i've done nothing mm. but watch film and educate myself on this process and educate myself on the game and then i have one of the best coaches if not the best coach james kraus in my corner mm. on this fight he, he took me in I needed somebody. He has me here. I'm outside of his house right now because oh. he's keeping a clo uh, close eye on me, pushing me every day. You know, we're, we're in this game, man. And the Julian 25 months ago in 2018 is nowhere on the same level as the Julian now, mentally, physically, emotionally, anything. I'm a, I'm, I'm a, different, I'm a different animal, and you guys will see how I bring it. And I don't even know what we're going to do on that fight. <laughs> you know, it could go anywhere and I'm ready for it. I could take it anywhere. And I love you working with James because James, I've talked to James a bunch of times, such a smart guy on the fight game in and out of the cage. I mean, that's a hell of a person to be around. Now, in this long awaited return, as you get Sapar Beck Safarov, now he's one in three in the UFC with all of those losses being finishes, being finished in the first or second round. Until tearing your back muscle in your lone UFC loss, you won five straight, being viewed as a serious prospect on the rise. Even with the long hiatus, people will probably favor you in this fight. So in your mind, what makes Safarov dangerous for you and not a very winnable fight like some might assume? Or really, is ring rust your body making it through the fight at healthy, really your biggest concerns and not so much what he's going to offer technically. This is the thing, man. I don't have to worry about him. I don't care to worry about him. That's not my goal. That's not my job. That's not anything. I have to go out there and perform to what my best capabilities are and what I've done in the past 25 months. And that's the thing is if I sit here and tell you what he's good at and what he's not, look, he's in the UFC. He's obviously good at something. True. He's fought some of the best people. I haven't watched his fights. I don't care to watch his fights. I only fight, saw one live fight, and that was the one against uh, Herberto um, Rivera, or not Herberto, uh, Rodolfo Riviera, or Vera. Mm. Um, I was there live at the place in the Jack Daniels Lounge. I watched that fight. Crazy little fight, crazy scenario. But at the end of the day, this guy has been training. He's still going. He hasn't had time off. He's fought some of the great. He's fought, um, you know, John Volante when John Volante was doing his thing. He's fought Tyson Pedro. He's fought um, Rodolfo, Rodolfo Vera, you know, a multiple time world champion, jiu jitsu practitioner. The guy's been in it with anybody. So if you're trying to look past somebody like that, then you're not where you need to be. But I don't have to worry about him. I don't worry about him. I worry about myself when I go in there and do what I know that I can do and do what I can. And I'm going to go out there. I'm going to get the win. It's going to be exciting. Everyone's going to tune in. Everyone's going to sit there and be bummed if they didn't watch it. <laughs> this is my time. So, I mean, a lot of people are going to look at this fight like wondering, oh, is he, is, is he's worried about the ring rust? Is he worried about the, the his body? Stuff like that? So that's not even a concern. Then the, the, Safarov's not a concern. Would you say just your biggest concerns, because I'm sure every fighter has some concerns going to a fight, is it just making sure you nail you, what you're supposed to nail and, and technically and strategically do what you're supposed to do? Honestly, it almost seems like your mind frame is for a guy that hasn't even been out that long. No, nah, man. Look, there's always going to be concerns when you go out there and we can nitpick and we can say all this stuff, but I don't care. I don't <laughs> care if it stands up. I don't care if it goes to the ground. I don't care if we decide to grow wings, we fly up and we can become, <laughs> you know, two birds that are fighting outside the cage. Yeah. It doesn't matter where it goes. The ring rust, it doesn't matter. You know what happens with ring rust? Those are people that weren't training, that mm. are sitting there on the side that made excuses. This is the thing. I didn't make excuses. I've been sitting there. Like I said, I've been cr or seeing my who, where, where's, and why's, how to cross T's, and how to dot I's on this stuff. And I am more emotionally, mentally, and physically stronger and prepared for this matchup. 
Now, stepping away from fighting a bit, one of the things you just kept you busy. You've definitely kept busy media-wise, your time away. You have a gift for Gab. You are very active on Instagram, which I follow, and it's blowing up all the time. Also, you have this podcast with adult film star Kendra Luss called Beauty and the Beast. Talk to me about the origin story of that show. Like, how did you guys connect originally, brainstorm the idea? And if you had to explain to me or anybody the basic premise of the podcast, what would it be? All right, so it's a Beauty and the Beast podcast. We have to add that podcast because Disney owns Beauty and the Beast. Okay. But again, as you can see, Kendra Lust is the beauty. I'm the beast, mm. but it depends on the day. Sometimes I'm the beauty. She's the beast. <laughs> Her and I have been friends for a long time. Her oh. and I have always had uh, great conversations, great vibes. And, you know, we both have been doing our own little thing on the podcast side. We decided to team up, bring our power, our star power together. And all we do is talk about sex, bets, fights, and relationships. Hmm. That's what we're in there. We, we point out hotties that we find on Instagram. We sit there and talk about the emotions that those girls make us feel when we look at them. Hmm. And, you know, they could be guys, too. Now, you know, <laughs> we're not picking anything different, and that's, the, that's what we're about. We're about having fun. We're about to talk about things that most people are afraid to talk about, especially in relationships. A lot of people have all these issues. A lot of people have all these problems, and they don't know who to ask. They ask some random person that's their friend. Their friend thinks they know. Look, who are you going to ask whenever you be- need some advice in the bedroom? You're going to ask Kendra Lust. Who do you need to ask whenever you're going to slide into the DMs? You ask <laughs> Julian. That's what you do. That's what that podcast gives you. So when you want to tune into it and educate yourself and have a good little laugh, check us out, Beauty and the Beast podcast. And where can they find it? Is it a YouTube exclusive? Is it on a certain sites? Yeah, we're on YouTube. We're on Apple. We're on Spotify. We're on uh, Anchor, we're on Google Play, we're we're everywhere. Wherever you want to go, we're on all the mainstream podcast, uh, you know, audible stuff as well. That you can watch the visual on YouTube. 